Neil Aspinall is a gentleman who has been with the Beatles since before. Since before Love Me Do and She Loves You and I Want to Hold Your Hand. In those grand old days when they were touring through Germany and, uh, well, he's just an old friend. Derek Taylor introduced him to us and said, if you want to find out more about the Beatles, if you want to find out more about the Beatle album covers, the man to talk to is Neil Aspinall. And we did. It sounds like a publicity stunt. He's wearing a black carnation in the thing, he's got no shoes on, you know. Crazy. There's 50 million people in India with no shoes on, you know. You're trying to tell me they're all dying or dead, you know. <laughs> you, uh, you were in on all the album covers that are in question, like the Sgt. Pepper and, uh, well, the Magical Mystery Tour, the... Um, present album. Um, I think the one that I remember you closely associated with because you got credit for it was like the insert in the Magical Mystery Tour album, the American version. And um, a lot of people brought up questions about that. In any of that, I believe you were kind of editorial supervisor in fact, weren't you? Well, that's a good joke. You know. It's like I, I get together all the album covers and all the artwork and all the advertising. Well, I don't want credit in for it. Credit's ego, you know, so. Now, the big thing is, and the big question is, are there anything in these album covers? People are seeing all kinds of things. You were there when they were constructed. For instance, Sgt. Pepper. How did that album cover come about? And how much influence did the Beatles themselves have in making the album cover? They had a lot of influence in making it. They knew what they wanted. They knew we, want, we knew we wanted a collage, and we knew they were going to dress up like they did with instruments. We got Peter Blake to do a, like a, a flower arrangement at the front, you know, and then a few other people like I did dolls and things to it. And then we took a picture, that was all. Well, let me tell you some hidden of... meaning. <laughs> Let me, let me let me go step by step some of the things they see in that album cover. You'd be amazed. Yeah, this is the, this is the other thing. I don't know what upcoming goals, and I don't know what people are supposed to be seeing in all of these things. You know, but I've heard of Black Carnation. That's all, and something about if you turn an album cover around backwards and show it in a mirror, it gives you somebody's number. So, you know, but you never go to all that trouble. You know, if somebody was dead, you say it. You don't go to into all this rubbish that's going on. You know. Like, for instance, one of the things they say is, like, on the doll, there is an automobile, see? On, on the leg, the doll, the one that says, Welcome Rolling Stones. Yeah. And there's an automobile, and it's facing the word stones, and they find that somehow indicative of a car that Paul died in, see? Well, he died in a car. <laughs> uh, I've never seen it, you know. So when you got the thing together, it was just everybody putting their two cents worth in and, and, and making for a collage. Yes, that's right. And were the people in the background put in afterwards? Uh, no, they were putting first, and then it was built up around that. Sort of overlaid and, uh, on a, a layout table. Yeah, right. No, it wasn't overlaid. You know, it was like, it was in a studio. We put the collage up first. Mm -hmm. You know. And then we put the flowers down and arranged them a bit, you know, and then a few dolls were added. And I think there's like, a, we got some things from Madame Tussauds, like the four Beatles mm -hmm. that they did in wax, you know. I think Cassius Clay's in there and uh, a few other people, you know, and then the Beatles just walked into the middle of it and had the photograph taken, that's all it was. So, in other words, it was done as at one sitting. I thought it might have been cropped and work done on it uh, that way. One sitting. Just in one evening. Uh, perhaps you know some of the significance within that album. People are constantly bringing up Billy Shears. I guess this has been the biggest mystery. They feel that if they phone a certain number that is given to them in clues, at Wednesday morning at 5 o'clock, they're going to get Billy Shears. They're going to take them off to an island in the South Pacific, which is a paradise set up by the people. Billy Shears is like Alan or Rigby or, you know. It's just a name that was used in a, a song. You know, it's got no meaning at all. No more meaning than Eleanor Rigby. How much meaning is there in Beatles songs? I mean, you've been with the Beatles a while. I don't write them. Let's go on the Magical Mystery Tour. Um, that album cover. Um, they claim that uh, the uh, th three of the Beatles are in white and that uh, Walrus, which is Paul, supposedly, um, was it Paul as the Walrus? 
Do you mean in those costumes? Yeah. No, it's John. It's John as the walrus. Yes. Yes. You see, now this is the thing they've all been saying, is that uh, Paul was the walrus, and walrus is a word that means corpse in Greek. Does it? <laughs> Well, on the in the on the that album cover, it's John dressed up as a walrus. You, know. you can't tell because they've all got those funny suits on. So I mean, yeah. You know. But that's who was in the walrus outfits because John wrote the song. Yeah. You know. Will you say that one more time for our American audience about who the walrus is? The walrus is John. That should settle. A lot of things right there. Do you remember any of the photography and magical mystery tours, such as the with them in tuxedos, and maybe why a black carnation for Paul, red carnations for everybody else? Um, it wasn't planned. You know, they put those white suits on just to to do a Mickey take on those old movies. You know, where you see people like Fred Astaire type of thing. Yeah, and uh, there was a lot of carnations around. Three of them picked red ones. Paul picked the black one. Out. You know, it could have been any one of the others. You know, or they could have all had different colours. It was incidental. You know, it didn't mean anything. And let's go on to uh, the double uh, album, the white covered album, on the collage inside, uh, on the back of which are the lyrics. People are saying that passport photo is not Paul, but the guy who has replaced him, and that that uh, was a picture of a William Campbell, who was the winner of the lookalike contest. Now you probably know what that photo is. What is that? I don't photo? know which photograph you're talking about. Which passport photo? It's a picture. Somebody who looks very much like Paul with a mustache. It looks like a passport and photo. Glasses on. Yes. Uh, no, it's crazy. You know, there's pictures of me on that as well that I don't recognize from when I was 18, you know, that Paul just dug up from somewhere. And that one with the photographs on, with their glasses on, it's a, it's a funny story. We were in uh, Sweden years and years ago, you know, and uh, the four of us went down into the like restaurant to eat, and Paul stayed upstairs, you know, and then he came into the restaurant, well, he didn't come in. This photographer came in saying, Parisi, Parisi, take your picture, take your picture. And uh, he had a moustache and glasses and his hair swept back. And he went around the whole restaurant, like, laying on the floor and doing angle shots of people, giving them this, like, plastic card. And then he'd go to another table, take some more, then go and take the card off the people he'd just given, because he only had one card, and give it to someone. And suddenly we realized that it was Paul doing it all. And he'd gone upstairs, he'd put this moustache on, glasses, swept his hair back, and none of us recognized him. And it was hilarious, you know, he just had a scream, you know. And then he went back upstairs, and he came to, and there was a couple of people at our table, too, you know, besides us, who didn't recognize him, you know. And they kept saying, where's Paul? And we were saying, I don't know, you know. And then this photographer left the room, it was, you know, Paul, and went back upstairs, combed his hair down, took the glasses off and moustache, and came and sat down. And then these people that were with us were just telling him about this mad photographer that had just been around. You know, it was a scream, and it was um, somebody took a picture of him in that disguise. Yeah, you know, this is only about 19 or something. You know, and he's just found that picture and used it on the collage. But it isn't somebody else. You know. Once again, we go away with another one of the myths, which brings us around to Abbey Road. The bare feeder because he felt like doing it, right? He was bare footed for the whole album. You know, while they were cutting it. Yes. Oh, well, sandals. You know, it was the middle of the summer. You know, it was June, July, and August that that album was cut. And they were all in bare feet and sandals and things, you know. Because why wear clogs? Or boots, you know. So, in other words, when a Beatle album cover is made, Contrary to what people want to think now, there are no hidden meanings thrown into it. It's just a lot of people having a lot of fun. Couldn't be bothered putting hidden meanings into it. What's the point? Of, if you've got something to say, say it. Don't hide it and hope people spot it. WMCA New York. Why do you think people are doing this? Why, why do you think all of a sudden they're trying to find every bit of significance they can in every word, every picture that they can possibly find of the Beatles? Because somebody started a rumor, you know, probably, and uh, people then build on that, you know. In many respects, I think this is even more of a phenomenon than what happened in 1963 and 64 when the Beatles first hit. Well, I don't know, you know, I've heard very little about it. I just got back from the States on Wednesday with Ringo, 
and uh, we got off the plane and suddenly this fella is shoving microphones in your mouth and all that. I go, what is it, what is it? Just didn't know what was going on at all. You know, saying, uh, Paul's dead. And, and you know, yeah, one fellow was saying, uh, uh, I've got an interview with Paul this afternoon. Can you confirm if he's dead or not? Uh, what? <laughs> you know, you're going to talk to him this afternoon. Don't be asking me if he's dead now. You're stupid. You know. well, have you heard the complete rumor or shall I repeat it to you? You can repeat it to me. I don't know. Supposedly, according to the people who are believing this rumor, Paul McCartney died in an automobile crash after completing a session in, in making the album Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. He took off in a car, <laughs> blew his mind out in the car, right? And uh, that's what the lyric's supposed to mean, according to the, the people who are promulgating the rumor. And uh, he was killed at that time. Not knowing what to do and not wishing to smash the British economy, a double was quickly found and since then has been impersonating Paul McCartney. And so far as voice is concerned, the Beatles themselves, the three, three remaining ones have been. And of course, to them, it is evident in such lyrics as uh, in uh, Come well, Together, One and one or, th one or Three. I wonder who just got married. Yeah. How do they account for that? Yeah. Well, you've known Paul uh, even before the Beatles were a success. Yeah, but who just got married? I mean, if you're supposed to die in 1966, who just got married in 1969? Well, that, that's supposedly William Campbell. But then he couldn't be married under the name of Paul McCartney. You know. Another thing, if you want to prove whether he's dead or not, go down to the records office at Somerset House, you know. Oh, but you see, they've all got to be registered there. These people have got answers for everything, like the British government is behind this. Well, you know. It's not if, uh, if, then they'll have answers for anything I say to them, you know. <laughs> and uh, if uh, they think the British government's covering, then they'll, it's obviously I'm going to be covering too. So anything you've got on tape that I've said is just, it's ludicrous, you know. I guess there's really no way of proving it unless, uh, you know, Paul no, were to say... That's what thing. Anthony said, is ignore it. You know, I know he's not dead. If people want to go around saying he is, they can only say it for so long and then they get fed up, you know. Well, maybe if they think he's dead, they'll quit bugging him. They'll probably bug him more. <laughs> oh. He really doesn't have that private a life, does he? It's all right, you know. He doesn't do it too bad. But it, it has its hindrances in oh, the... Yeah. Of like, course it does. Like I was talking to Derek, and he says there's a constant group of people outside his home in uh, St. John's Wood, yeah. yeah. Wait out there, uh, patiently waiting to see Paul or a glimpse of him. And I understand you have kids out in front of Apple all day long. All the time. Night and day. Oh, I don't know about night time. But During the daytime, yeah. And I, you know, I said, I thought maybe Derek was referring to kids who occasionally I walk out the door and there's a girl walking back and forth, back and forth. Well, it's worse in the summer because of all the tourists and things, you know. In the winter, it's a bit too cold and raining and all that for them to be out there. But apart from that, it's okay. How do you uh, yourself account for the whole Beatle thing? Nothing has ever been this strong, this... In, in exactly this way, uh, here are four guys, four human beings, who have managed to almost become a spiritual thing to a lot of people around the world. Uh, it's a little hard for you to look at it this way because you know them as people, people that you've known, enjoy good times with. Why do you think this has happened? Why? Uh, was there a need for it in the world, and so they were chosen to be it? I don't know about them being chosen. I don't even know whether there was a need for it. No. It just happened, you know. And it wasn't planned. It's still happening now, and we're still not planning it. You know. Everything that's happened has happened natural. Yes. It's amazing how many times a, a manager of a group will do everything he can to hype something or figure out a publicity stunt. But the Beatles really have just evolved as a natural thing. They've yeah, never done anything, uh, you know, never done anything as a publicity stunt. Never, never sit around having secret planning sessions saying, here's our next strategy. No, never had any strategy. It was just like when we did Ed, Ed Sullivan, you know, the first Ed Sullivan we ever did. Brian booked it for whenever, I think it was February or something. He booked us on three Ed Sullivan shows. And we were on top of the bill. He just booked us on and we got like $1,000 or something you know, for each show. And then we were in Paris during the Olympics. 
and uh, suddenly and we were getting cash box and billboard you know and suddenly you notice know, I want to hold your hand was 82 and then jumped up and jumped up and by the time we got to the States it was number one yeah. you know we got to the States and did Ed Sullivan you know but we could just as easily have got to the States without any hints at all and done Ed Sullivan like bottom of the bill and come home and nobody would have ever have known you know it just that it happened that way. It's like if we got to number one and then we tried to book on the Ed Sullivan, it probably wouldn't have worked. You know, but booking on the Ed Sullivan when we didn't have any hits in America and then having a hit just just timed so right just before we got there, you know, it's impossible to plan things like that. They just happen, you know. And it's been, I, we've only picked out like one example, but it's been like that forever, you know, it's always been like that. You ever sometimes sit around and say to yourself, it's a. Uh, it's miraculous. I don't know how it ever happened. Oh, no. <laughs> Never sit around thinking about that at all. What direction now do you think the Beatles are going in music and uh, in their lifestyles? They seem to be going four different directions now. Always have been. We've just got more time now because um, we're not touring anymore. You know? We've got more time to get into other things, you know. But what, what things other than touring, you know. Because that touring is such a waste of time, you know. You were on all their tours, weren't you? I, I emceed the show in Houston, Texas, where they had to get them out of the plane in a meal truck. Well, there's been all those trips. But they, for me, it was really a waste of time. Like, being on stage was all right, you know. That, that bit of it was good. But it was just like the... 23 and a half hours getting to go on stage for half an hour. You know, you wasted all that time traveling around in airplanes and meat wagons and all that. And it's all that time where you can't do anything. You know, you're sitting in airplanes reading magazines. And at, that, at that time, you needed it, though, in order to get the public oh, yeah, right, exposure. Right. Of course we needed it, you know, and it, we needed to go through it, and it was a good thing at the time, you know. But we've got been through that now. And we're not doing that. So all those hours that we were used in traveling can be used to do other things now, you know. That's why they, they seem to be going in different directions. Like Ringo appears to be doing films, which he is doing because he's got time to do them now. You know, he's got time to do a film instead of doing a tour. You know, and while he's doing a film, John will be doing something else and Paul will be doing something else. And so will George, you know. It seems uh, to me, too, and this was something that uh, appeared to me, I guess, finally with Abbey Road, that uh, the Beatles themselves have learned, I think more than anyone else, the technique of using a recording studio to the best advantage. You can only think of one other guy that has used the recording studio almost as an instrument itself, and that was Phil Spector. Uh, because I listened to the intricacy of the recording and the... I guess from my angle, you know, knowing recording, uh, the technique that's used in the studio, and I hear it never employed as well as I hear it on B-Labs. Now, is this because of them, or George Martin, or who? It's a bit of both. Yeah. But I find that uh, you should use everything that's around you, you know, all the time, you know, because you can't just pick out certain bits of it and say, well, you can't pick out certain bits and say, I'll just use that this time. But I don't think that having great recording techniques and all that, is, I don't think that's the ultimate or the essence or whatever you want to call it. I don't think it's... I don't think it, yeah, I don't know it's got anything, you know. But it, it's okay if you can use all those recording techniques like on Walrus, and like inside the Sergeant Pepper album, a lot of it was used, you know. I also like the idea of being able to do things like Blackbird, which is one voice and one guitar, you know, which is just as good as Walrus, you know. You know what I mean? You can get, as long as you can do go to both ends of the scale and use them both, and know you can use them both, and know that they're both as good as each other, and then you can use anything in any combination in the middle as well, you know. But just to go one way and use great big orchestras and great recording technique and all that and not do yesterdays and blackbirds it would be wrong you know? With, well I'll tell you I uh, find that for something like blackbird 
is was so well done from a studio technique point as well because the showmanship in a person is when he knows number one when how to do the tune I mean there's so many ways you can do a tune you can write your material and try it 20,000 different ways but to know the way it's going to show best is showmanship and I was talking with John Mayo in America last week and John was saying that the other technique is knowing when you've stayed your welcome and you leave in other words end the tune at the right point as opposed to overstaying that welcome and I think the Beatles have this timing the showmanship that no other group to this day yeah. possesses yeah a lot of people with uh, Hey Jude which I thought was fantastic you know, just this seven minute long track I just played it to a lot of people and just the reaction from it was like oh don't you think it's a bit too long <laughs> you know it goes on a bit you know then you cut it down to about two and a half minutes or something yeah uh, we could have cut it down to two and a half minutes with the seven minutes it was so great you know and finally the public did accept it the seven minutes in fact I was, dri I was driving you know and uh, it, it is that bit about knowing where to get on and get off you know well the first uh, the first time I heard it I went hey no wait a minute you know it's too repetitious and I was driving down the highway listening to it one night and I found myself getting stoned listening to it this thing the repetition and the build up and the the, the the just the development of it and like for instance on the new album uh, I Want You She's So Heavy I think is one of the best things in the album and it's the same kind of building up building up building up building up and then that immediate just almost like somebody cut the tape yes it's showmanship and I think this is this is something that uh, a lot of groups in the, uh, around the world today are trying to make it like the Beatles did but I don't think they have the showmanship no it's like see but that's well, it's wrong, you know. They shouldn't try to make it like the Beatles did. <laughs> because how do we know how the Beatles made it? If the Beatles don't know how they made it. You know, you can only do your own thing the best way you can. Hope it works, you know, and that's all we've ever done. That's all you ever can do. But if your own thing is to manufacture something, you know, how long can you go on manufacturing something? 